the CEO Hour with Dean Akers. The mission, to help CEOs and startups succeed in today's marketplace. Entrepreneur or established CEOs, is your business growing? Where is your business going? Let's talk about it with your host, Dean Akers. Welcome to the CEO Hour. I'm your host, Dean Akers, bringing you top CEOs and entrepreneurs each week that share their journeys. This includes their thoughts and ideas that's helped them in their success, and equally as important, a lot of thoughts and ideas of things they would want to impart to you that they would not do again. So today, I'd like to welcome Chase Stockin, CEO of Panther International. Welcome, Chase. Thanks for having me on the show, Dean. Well, Chase, um, our, our listeners really love the journeys of our entrepreneurs because um, you know, as most of people meet us in today's environment, they just think we just happened this way, right? Yeah. So y- you were born, was it in September? It was. And that was what, five years ago? Yeah, just about 1963, Dean. So that's when the journey starts. Tell me about the start of the journey as best you can start remembering your, where you grew up and kind of how that early part of your journey went. All right. Um, so I was born, I was the, born in Southern California. I was the third child of four. I was the oldest of the youngest. Um, There were sort of two groups, and I was the third of the fourth. Um, I'm the son of a dyslexic teacher. My mom was a dyslexic teacher. Really? Reading specialist, yeah. I mean, Um, she she taught people with dyslexia? Correct. A little of both, maybe, but no, actually, that's more dad and me, you know, (laughs) some of those. Um, But no, she's a reading specialist that specializes in phonics and dyslexia. Wow. Uh, my father, my dad is an engineer. He was a civil engineer, which is what sort of led to the stories that you know uh, of my childhood from Southern California began to move every two years. And uh, I spent time sort of worldwide, Japan, Hong Kong, Switzerland, you know, a lot of Europe, um, back through to Hawaii. and then, With him. Uh, with him. The and, family. Yeah, as a family, we traveled. Some of it was his on his own. And. You know, we'd stay in one place, but most of it was family travel and growing up all the way up into high school. Uh, in high school, came back into Northern California and was able to finish high school in, in Northern California. And uh, so your brothers and sisters, have they all, are they uh, hanging out, doing, working in entrepreneurial? Yeah. So um, my dad, obviously, during that travel was in a big engineering firm. Um, subsidiaries um, of big, big engineering firms and, and working on big projects. So the BART Tunnel in San Francisco Bay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that was one of his major projects, um, which is what some of what led to uh, the Trans Harbor Tunnel in Hong Kong, which is what you drive through. So that was what kept us in Hong Kong for that. Anyway, um, and actually one of those stories you talk about, what, what leads us to where we are, one of those is when we got back to the United States, high school age, um, dad being a very strong guy, I remember one time my dad cried and it was something to do with work, something about that. And it wasn't too long after that, that he became an entrepreneur and started his own Marine con- uh, construction company. And he, he doesn't remember the day, but you know, that's as a, as a teenage boy, that's what starts you down a path that you don't know you're on and um wasn't too long ago too long after that that in high school i started my first entrepreneur and uh that may have led the path but i've been an entrepreneur pretty much off and on all the way since that had to take a lot of guts for your dad to leave a large engineering firm yeah um he's quite an adventurer um sort of to to give you sort of just a a little bit of background on him he was scuba diving in the 50s and 60s um back when only the navy guys were doing it with the dual Hose. Um, he was a rock climbing uh, guy and, and instructor in, in with the Sierra Club in California in the late 50s, early 60s with Royal Robbins. So, you know, it does take a lot of guts. I think he had it. And um, from a mentor stand, uh, standpoint, he's been one of the best for me. And, the, and it had to be a value to you to have all that travel as a young person to be exposed to that it, you learn how to make friends in a real hurry when you drop into that new school i'll tell you um 
Yeah, and you weren't in traditional schools, were you? No, um, British schools, German schools. You know, we as a family were kind of all over the board. But, you know, even even a public school in Hawaii, when you come back with a British accent, doesn't go over so well. No, I bet. <laughs> I bet. Uh, so, you know, that the the experiences, the 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 impact it had on me as a person, I can't uh, I can't even I can't even put a value on it. Wow. So you walked down the aisle for your uh for your high school graduation. Uh where does that journey take you? Well, like I said, I had um in high school it started, you know, pumping gas like every other kid in my neighborhood and then decided that wasn't enough for me and so I started my own business um from there uh ended up in Colorado what were you doing when you started what, or are you not allowed to in, say in high school? Yeah. yeah no I um I found a job and filled it so literally it was I the company was called Dirty Jobs Unlimited and you know it was a lot of construction type work um Doing doing various construction things that a sixteen seventeen year old can do. So you would you would somebody would need some help and you would find a sixteen or seventeen year old to go help them. No, that's, I was well, you at, as I was at the time, and and you know hired a lot of my classmates. So I'll give you just a prime example of, of find a need and fill it in California. Fire wildfire obviously is a huge issue. It's back being an issue, and the fire marshal used to go around and get serve notice if you were a homeowner they would serve you a notice that you have to cut the weeds that you know the natural grass that grows on your hill and uh once i figured that out i would actually go through behind that guy with a flyer and drop it that says you know here's what we do and uh, because when you get that notice you don't know you know how am i going to get this done i you know i don't have my teenagers at home anymore and so we'd show up so a lot of our our peak business was, you know, fire season. So yeah, following those guys. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they're still doing that out there. I, would have, I hope so, I mean, given what's going on out yeah, there. It seems so. like that. so. So now you graduate from high school. What's your trek? Did you go the college route? I did. So um, took me a little bit to get there, but I got there. I went to. Uh, I did my undergrad in Colorado. Um, started another business while I was in college. And, um, you know, pretty much partook of of all the activities of Colorado, you know, university in Colorado and um, worked worked my way through to the end of that. And at the end of that, uh, actually did an exchange program to the University of Tokyo uh, through another university and um, got to spend a semester over there doing that. That had to be interesting. That uh, was extremely interesting. But, you know, it was I, I kind of wanted to go back to Asia, having been there before, um, studied Asian economics for a full semester out there, and then uh, actually came back and finished uh, grad school in uh, San Francisco. So did you get an MBA then? I did. I got an MBA specializing in international transportation. And that's how you got your start, huh? Um, yeah, actually. So from all that travel as a kid... One of the things that, you know, strangely influences you is that I I love the smell of jet fuel. <laughs> that smell just meant travel. It meant happy people. It doesn't mean that so much these days with all the travel restrictions, but that's what it meant to me. It meant going someplace. It meant all of that. And so while I was finishing up in grad school, an opportunity opened up with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission working for Oakland and San Francisco International Airport. That's how I got my start. That's crazy. So, so, so now you're working with them. It, what did you start as a as a baggage claim guy? No, I mean, he actually started. I, so it was for airport planning um, and regional planning. Is that because your degree and stuff? Yeah, and um, you know, it was a lot of passenger surveys. You know, where are you going? What are you doing? This, that. You know, it was a little less data centric um, for that, but. It was a lot of a lot of being at the airport, dealing with airports, talking about where their flights were going. So, you know, in today's day, Joe Lapano and Chris Minner at, at Tampa are are worried about air service and that. So it was a lot of that kind of study. Um, spent a little time trying to get transit to the San Francisco airport. Um, and so those kind of broad kind of topics is what we were covering. Wow, that had to be pretty interesting. So so you're in a big organization or a small organization? Kind of mid size. Um, quasi government, um, and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission was, uh, um, I can't maybe T Barda, yeah, but, but T Barda on steroids, um, because it's California, 
Right. Um, so that's that's kind of what we were doing. Um, a lot of time at the airports, a lot of time smelling that jet fuel. I was I was in seventh heaven. So I'm gonna have to go out and smell me some jet fuel yeah, tonight and see what it does. See what it does to you. I actually we had a company years ago and we had a, a Lear 35, and I did like the smell of that jet fuel. That's the, yeah. <laughs> we had our own jet. That's exactly that right. So. But so um, before we go to the br- or when we go to the break and come back, we're going to learn more about that journey there. And you really you've been on that aviation kick since that day, right? Pretty much, yeah. That was the start of all of it. Well, I want to remind our listeners out there, we're here every week with, a, again, a top CEO or entrepreneur sharing their journey. And uh, one of the things that I find is as entrepreneurs, a good check is a, is a way to get grounded. And so the free offer for the CEO physical is available to everyone that listens to our show. And all you have to do is reach out at help at adjunctco.com. We have a lot of folks that are, are taking advantage of that that offer uh, it's a $10,000 offer, so, I mean, it's real money. But we love helping entrepreneurs as part of our give back. And, um, again, we're going to be back in a few moments with Chase for more exciting parts of his journey. The CEO Hour with your host, Dean Akers. Connect with Dean at deanacres.com. We'll be right back. So, you're a tech startup. You're working hard. Trying to make it happen with big ideas, big dreams, and a small budget. You need to connect with people in the same boat. Now is the time to join the early stage startup group, the Innovation Center, an incubator for early stage tech firms. You can find them at tbinnovates.com. Now operating for over 14 years, the Innovation Center is a regional, national, and internationally known success story, continuing to generate momentum in Pinellas County. Twice, the Innovation Center has won the Tampa Bay Technology Forum's Excellence in Service Award and has been recognized by Entrepreneur.com as a top 10 international business incubator. And now, TechGrad, a technology and entrepreneurship center, has joined forces with the Innovation Center to provide a co-working program in downtown St. Petersburg. Connect with the startup community. Connect with the Innovation Center. Go to TBInnovates.com. That's TBInnovates.com. And tell them the adjunct CEO sent you. If you're a CEO or organizational leader looking to expand your business, join the CEO Council, where you'll meet and exchange ideas with fellow CEOs without the pressures of a sales network environment. You can join today by sending an email to application at adjunctceo.com. The CEO Council is comprised of over 220 fantastic local business leaders you'll be able to learn from because they walk in your shoes every day. When you become a member of the CEO Council, you'll have an opportunity to build trusted relationships during the roundtable meetings, share your triumphs, vet ideas, and work through business challenges with peers who can provide real-world business solutions. The CEO Council offers opportunities to hear from world-renowned speakers that inspire ideas to help members grow as both leaders and individuals. Join the CEO Council. Request your CEO Council membership application today at adjunctceo.com or by sending email to application at adjunctceo.com. That's application at adjunctceo.com. Helping your business succeed in today's marketplace. Welcome back to the CEO Hour with Dean Akers. Well, welcome back to the second segment of the CEO Hour. Again, I'm your host, Dean Akers, bringing you top CEOs every week and entrepreneurs every week that share their journey, both the goods, the bads, and things they can impart to our listeners that will help them. And uh, we have Chase Stockton today that is uh, CEO of Panther International, who is a successful Tampa Bay entrepreneur that uh, really kind of chase. So you're a Tampa Bay entrepreneur. You're a Bay guy, huh? <laughs> I, yeah, one one Bay or the other, it seems. You know. Yeah. So, so now you're out in that San Francisco area helping that transit. And that had to be a pretty crazy journey there. Uh, yeah, you know, especially kind of as your first uh, foray into the quasi-government world, um, not overly cut out for some of that. Um, you know, I, I think Chris Sullivan, who I think you've had as a guest yeah. before – um, we've talked about rules and following rules and all of that. I don't do it very well. Um, most of us probably don't. And so, you know, you skirt a lot of those government um, ways of doing business, trying to get things done. It was a time when, to give you an idea, uh, mouse for your computer was coming out. 
um, windows was starting and that kind of stuff. And um, in my government world, I had to actually go through a requisition to get a mouse one time for a computer. And I went through four different iterations of requests. I went through four different meetings to do this. I think, you know, it was probably $1,000 worth of of requests. And they ended up giving me a $15 Microsoft reconditioned mouse. (laughs) So, you know, those kind of things are very frustrating to a lot of us. Um, So that was kind of the world that I was playing in back then. Um, I actually left um, to go to Denver Um, from there. Coincidentally, right about the same time as the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, if you remember the World Series earthquake, oh, yeah. um, I was in that area at that time. Um, bridges had, you know, been impacted, and so travel was difficult. It was a, it was a difficult time to get around, difficult uh, uh, way to operate. And what really amazed me, though, like any time a crisis, was to watch people change. People as a whole. Not just strangers on the street, but even within the organizations, you know, we were better people um, following so, uh, that. Follow up on that. Yeah. So what, share with me what you what you mean by that. Well, I think you saw it, you know, post 9-11 as right. well in New York. You know, we've got some history in, in 9-11 in, in New York, and I saw it again there. But, you know, the the little stuff that frustrates people didn't seem to frustrate people anymore. Gotcha. Um, you know, if you slipped a rule, so to speak, on something, it was less of a deal. It was, you know, the, the, everybody's vision was bigger. And you kind of get a glimpse during those times of what it could be. You know, what could make a great country, what could make a great organization, what could gr- make a great person. Um, you know, it's it's rare that you see – you know, some of the looting, some of the stuff, some of those kind of things that go on when the opportunity is ripe um, after those kind of events. Um, San Francisco basically closed down. Uh, law enforcement couldn't cover everything without right. any doubt. The places were on fire. Marina District was on fire, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, people were sharing phone cards at the time so you could call your loved one. They were sharing rides. Um, they were carpooling because the bridges were a mess. Um, for for months and months and months, so so that's a that's a pretty powerful thing. I appreciate the observation. I think the listeners should hear that somewhat again because in today's media and all the craziness going on, you would just think it's horrible out there. Right. And the reality is, your experiences show that people do really rally. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think so. And you know, I mean, we talk about mentoring. You you spend a lot of time. You and I've spent a lot of time talking about mentoring. Um, helping the you know the others uh, get charity work obviously CEO council we do a lot of charity work those kinds of things we do as a way to give back and if everybody anyway those are those crises are are this weird glimpse if you will into what that would be on a society level um, and it's actually kind of a cool utopia i guess yeah it's funny that a disaster like that brings people together we saw it after the hurricanes you see it, you know for sure nine nine eleven i mean i was in new york city literally i guess three weeks after or two and a half weeks after it was a different city than i'd ever been in before very much so wasn't it yeah so so now you're you you moved to denver and so, yeah, so moved to Denver. There's a, an agency, very similar type agency out there, Denver Regional Council of Governments, responsible for aviation on all of the um, airports in the, in the, in the metro area. Um, but the real exciting thing was we were building new Denver Airport at the time. And so to be, you know, that young in on that kind of almost justified that government agency thing because I got to to really play in some some amazing things the um, a, a lot of my job was to help coordinate with the FAA um, and all the locals for all the airspace you have to change all the airspace so all your approach patterns that you're used to seeing at Tampa International we had to change all of those for every airport because we moved an airport from downtown out in, you know, out further, oh, yeah. and it, it's got runways pointing different directions and everything else. So it was it was quite an experience to, to do all of that stuff. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Did you like Denver? Um, I love Denver. <laughs> you still like Denver? <laughs> yeah, I still like Denver. <laughs> That's a great. I'm, I'm, a great I'm back. So yeah. So actually, I this is you know you know my secret. I live there part time now even, but <laughs> it's actually trip number three. So I actually did undergrad. I went back for for this work, um, and then now I'm sort of back there part time back there. So how did that piece of the journey uh, finish or? start to the next piece yeah so i was actually recruited out of there um and so i was recruited to an organization in washington dc called the national association of state aviation officials and it's really a think tank of all dot aviation people so i I represented the state governments um and you know jumping ahead you know where panther lands and so you can see how this this path goes but my job was to represent on the Hill um, and and provide sort of nationwide advocacy and consistency for all of the state DOT's aviation efforts um, up there. And so great opportunity, newly married, living in D.C., horrible for family life at the time, um, which in the end prompted, you know, my departure. But it, that was an, another great opportunity – but, you know, in the back of your mind, you always think I can solve politics and living in D.C. Pretty much, you know, that that's not possible for an individual to do that. It's a, it's a collective effort. And so, you know, my my thoughts, however remote they were of being Senator Stalken, um, pretty much <laughs> passed by the way right then and there. So how old were you then? Uh, Thirty one. Thir- wow. Twenty nine to, to thirty I guess. So you're in your early 30s or late 20s, and your passport must be looking insane. Yeah, that's got to be a journey that um, that has really helped mold some of your adventure and stuff today. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I get antsy feet, so I got to keep moving, and you know it drives the speed and, and some of that. But you know, I think the DC piece was was really a culmination of. It, it it was kind of a fast ascension, if you will, and so it really caused me to back up and realize that what I really wanted was to be back on my own. I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. That's that's where my my family roots come from, if you will, and and that's really where my life comes from. Is that because you got tired of the bureau? The, call you do. it the the thousand dollar mouse. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's. It, it, there's just so many stories in D.C. I mean, you, you've spent time up there. There's, you know, there's just thousands and thousands of opportunities to do things better. And, you know, I could only impact one or two. Well, I took my kids up there several times and had them have a VIP or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And they clearly learned a civics lesson. The government is run by staff. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so everybody thinks the senators are making yeah. decisions. They don't even know. No, I, I would agree with you on that one. And it's 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 pretty funny. And and before we go to the break, you mentioned Chris Sullivan, and and I I, I never understood his theme of the Outbacks, which was um, uh, just right, you know. And 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 I was like, wow, how'd you come up with that? I thought it was just his his logo or whatever. He's it was uh, no rules, just right. Yeah. And his whole background was he told all the employees, we have no rules. Just do what's right. And I thought, how profound. And that's what you're saying. That's exactly. Yeah, that's so cool. Well, Chase, um, before we go into segment three, uh, I just want to ask you. So, D.C., you pack up. We got a few seconds left in segment two. Do you come straight to Tampa or is that a unsolicited, a no job, no idea what I'm going to do? We should probably carry this into the next segment because that's quite the story. Okay, well, let me reach out and remind our listeners that uh, that that uh, CEO Physical is available for free at help at adjunctceo.com. And I also want to remind people, because we're getting hundreds of, well, thousands of downloads to the Adjunct CEO Hour podcast. So if you or some of your friends miss this uh, today's episode, all the episodes are up on uh, the Adjunct CEO Hour podcast, which is on all the major networks. Uh, and you can listen to that. And then also, if you're just crazy about my about my voice, you can reach out. And, and I have the uh, Selling, Ninja, Selling Leadership Ninja Show, which is a 8 to 12-minute rant every week. And it's just me ranting about something that happened that week. I've got tens of thousands of downloads, 135 countries now. So it's pretty insane. 
So again, we'll be back in segment three with Chase Stockton telling us more about his unbelievable adventure and the things he's learned in his growth in entrepreneurship. Helping established CEOs and entrepreneurs. Connect with Dean at DeanAkers.com. The CEO Hour continues in a moment. Helping to navigate today's marketplace for startups and mainstays. Welcome back to the CEO Hour with Dean Akers. Well, welcome back to the third segment of the CEO Hour. Again, I'm your host, Dean Akers, bringing you top entrepreneurs and CEOs each week that share the journey. This week, we have Chase Stockton on, and he is the CEO of Panther International. And we have just uh, finished up in segment two of he and his wife sitting in D.C., Wondering, is this really where we want to be? Tell me what happens. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about why D.C. wasn't the place. And I was looking for a place to start out. And so we actually went down. This is a true Tampa Chamber of Commerce story. We went down a list and, you know, we defined certain things. And and Major League Sports, Broadway-level performing arts, uh, water or mountains, I don't care as long as I can be outdoors. Um, But the Broadway level and the and the Uh, major league sports really wasn't necessary i'm not that big a sports fan but what it defines is a level um, of a community and what we were looking for was the smallest city we could find a big city we could find or even better the biggest small town we could find and if you go through what tampa has or had even then um you know they were probably the smallest area smallest city that had major league sports multiple major league sports and broadway level performing arts and and the you know right on the water and everything else and so without a company without a job without anything moved to tampa and um you know 20 years later or 25 years later here we sit so 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 you you pack up you move down here do you do you do you sit there and look in the mirror and go, what am I going to do? Or do you go get a job at Burger King? Or what do you do? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a firm. We do a lot of speaking at UT and some of that's entrepreneur classes. And one of the things I always believe in is always, always have your first client before you ever start, because I've seen a lot of great ideas fail that, you know, couldn't get to market fast enough because they just didn't, you know, didn't have a buyer um, and you run out of cash, um, as you well know, before then. So, um, a little to that case, my best state um, for aviation money was Florida. And so that's part of what drove the Florida decision as well. Um, and I had called them and they said, yeah, we've got an idea on something we want to do that fits kind of what you're talking about. Um, and so literally my first client was the state of Florida. And 25 years later, they remain the first client and still a client of Panther International. Well, so you moved down here. That's when you pretty much fa- founded Panther International. I did. So it's a, it's a uh, SaaS-based software program today, right? Correct. But 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 it obviously wasn't then. No, it was a, a sneaker net um, system. So the, it, the, the origination of it was driven then that the FAA and the state both give money to airports, um, and and in doing that, they're trying to coordinate, but it was very difficult. And so the very first package was called Joint JSEP, Joint Automate, a Joint Aviation Capital Improvement Program. And the joint was to tie the FAA to the states. And I knew both sides of that from D.C. and from the states. And so, um, you know, worked on this software package to coordinate that effort and and make that process a lot better. That has now grown over and over and over and over um, into the SaaS based system that's still there today. So, so really, you you were almost a, a not almost you were a consultant. Uh, very much, yeah. Um, we were developing a system for the DOT, but really, it's about process improvement. Yeah. So, how, so now you you pack up, you move down to Tampa, Florida, was and you start out call it with your first client, which is the state. Correct. How, how how does moving here? How does that? Was there shock? Yeah, from DC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first Christmas when you can ride your bicycle around and it's not full of snow and ice. Yeah, that was shock. That was good shock. Yeah, that was good shock. Um, yeah, from a from a um, it, let's go from a growth standpoint. I think because you know very it it obviously I needed employees very quickly. 
Um, and and as you know, back then, you know, the tech of you know an area the size of of Tampa um, in the South, um, there were a lot of names given to a lot of the Florida communities back then. Um, it was a difficult challenge for the IT world. A, it was small as a, as an industry anyway. Programmers weren't turning out of all the universities, which you know, you know, great graduates now from all the local universities. But uh, personnel was a big issue. Yeah. yeah. So was that not on your radar, or did you come down here not expecting to do a software, but just came down here to consult and stuff? And I, I came down originally to to consult and solve a problem for DOT. Um, the fact that it merged, you know, two of my backgrounds together um, on the on the software side and the and the transportation side was kind of a bonus. Um, but it it could have been anything. It wasn't specifically designed to be IT. Uh, it was designed to stay in transportation as mu- as long as I could, doing something. Uh, was it was it, would, for our listeners out there? Would you share with them that it's really about about solving problems? And if you solve problems, how you do it can create that business. Absolutely. Um, again, I would challenge that you find the first person to to buy right. your your solution. Um, but yeah, it really is. I mean, we've shifted gears. Like any entrepreneur, um, over over 25 years, we've shifted gears. We had a transition probably about year six, seven, or eight, somewhere in there, where it really went mentally from a lifestyle business, if you will, to, to a full-blown company. I mean, it's, um, you know, the, the mentality changed in, in everything that we did. Well, share with me what that means, because that's – that. Having been a CEO and grown a bunch of companies myself, I see that as kind of like a a, a, a real block for most uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah, and it does. It takes a different mindset completely. Um, you know, I look go back to my family, the the family business that that my dad started that we talked about. He took it so far, and then you could see that entrepreneurship sometimes doesn't let go. It doesn't. It's a different mentality. Um, that business is now run by my brother, my oldest brother, and he has a different mentality. He couldn't have started it because of the risk factors and some of that, but it, he's what you know has been able to grow it. And so it's a very difficult thing, I think, sometimes to recognize when it's time to shift. I think people are capable of it. I think entrepreneurs are capable of it. But to make the shift from entrepreneur to, to CEO. Well, I've won over the years all these entrepreneur awards and different things, bootstrap awards and everything. I actually have always been the second guy in, yeah. whether it was doing a turnaround of a company or whatever. So I've never just been the flat, good old fashioned. Give me a couple hundred thousand dollars, yeah, right. and, and I'll hold it and see how well you do because that's what it's really all about. You're right. gambling. Yeah, you're gambling. Uh, that's the early gamble. So. Now, I've gambled my own money, but it wasn't a startup. Right. I've, I've taken over companies and stuff. So so now you get down here. Uh, did you develop? Did you have a family here? Uh, yeah. So once we got here, um, same, same woman, thank you. Um, we had our two kids here um, over the last period. Panther has obviously grown. Um, that that one state that we were in is now 22 states that we're in um you know the the numbers we move uh grant aviation and and transit and uh, transportation money move about uh 13 billion dollars now um nationwide uh i have two kids they're successfully grown um so are they involved in the business no um a a hair on the young side for for where they are now i still have a son in, in high school um, but I have a daughter in um, at UCF um, studying something completely different than than what I do. So good for her. Um, but what's no. she studying? Uh, hospitality and entertainment management. Well, you'll laugh. My oldest son's passion was roller coasters. He studied there and followed his passion, which I encouraged him to do. And now he's director of attractions, opening up Universal in in Beijing, China. It's his fourth park he's opened, and he, he wins all these awards, international, all this crazy stuff. And I joke because he's never worked a day in his life. Yeah, well, and that's what – actually, that's where she started was roller coasters, um, and that was what her interest was. She's evolved to sort of that large music scene, the Burning Man kind of – Oh, yeah. And so she's working um, and doing you know a lot of those kind of shows. So 
We'll see where we'll see where it goes. It's, well, when uh, she's yeah. back in town, please hook me up for breakfast, and I'll share with her Doug's story yeah, that'd and be stuff. Awesome. She'll that'd be awesome. she'll she'll really enjoy that. Uh, so so, what's your son wanting to do? <laughs> that was a, <laughs> if you didn't hear that on the radio, that was a father's sigh. <laughs> uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, he a lot of interest in a lot of different things. Um, it's he's you know he's a good kid. He's very passionate about a lot of stuff, but. Uh, I don't think it's focused yet, so we'll see. Well, we'll as see. long as he has passion, that's he that's the foundation because yeah. he'll figure that out. Um, yeah. I've been working with a lot of kids, and that's one of my favorite things is helping kids develop their passions and stuff. Yeah, and I and I really believe that you know it doesn't matter what your kids do as long as they're passionate about it, they'll be a success. So, so you don't think he wants to do aviation uh, grant software? No, I really don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what I've done to to uh, disencourage my kids, but no, I've I've we've had this discussion, and neither one have any interest. I think in the tech world or the transportation world. Well, so. you got to be proud of them taking their own journey. So I, I am. We'll be back in uh, segment four, the final segment coming up here shortly. But I want to remind all our listeners, uh, Chase is sharing his journey today for sure. And uh, that's always fun. But we have the uh, Adjunct CEO Hour podcast if you want to go back and listen to any of the previous uh, episodes. And and I know people are listening because I check the podcast stats and all the podcasts keep getting listened to over and over and over. So that I know it's a big help to our listeners out there. And I know when we get chases up on the system, it'll be heard worldwide, too, like the other ones. Uh, and again, I'm Dean Akers, the host of the CEO Hour. And each week we bring you top CEOs and entrepreneurs. And we'll be back into segment four with Chase Stockton as he really tells us how this journey keeps on rocking. Success never takes the weekend off. Connect with Dean at DeanAkers.com. The CEO Hour continues in a moment. Growth begins by understanding where you are now. For a limited time, business growth experts at Adjunct CEO will provide a full CEO physical of your business valued at $10,000. For free, email CEO physical at adjunctceo.com. This offer includes financial, marketing, and sales analysis and an outline to help you strategize future success. For your free CEO physical, email CEO physical at adjunctceo.com. CEO physical at adjunctceo.com. Com. Florida ranks high as a new hub for business growth and innovation. Startups, restarts, and starting over are all part of the new vitality generated as geography and economic opportunity collide. As Florida's entrepreneurial ecosystem grows, many are using Synapse to grow their business. Synapse is a groundbreaking methodology that connects all personas within the innovation economy, utilizing a method that enables all users to progress in meeting their given needs while promoting much-needed community engagement. Never more than now has Florida presented opportunity to be better aligned in business, providing huge potential for greater overall results with strong collaboration and holistic leadership. Synapse is a growth synthesis platform that will allow you to take advantage and flourish in ways you never thought possible as an entrepreneur, as a business, and within the context of community, events, connections, publishing, all with Synapse. See for yourself at SynapseFL.com. That's SynapseFL.com. Helping your business succeed in today's marketplace. Welcome back to the CEO Hour with Dean Akers. Well, welcome to the final segment of the CEO Hour. Again, I'm your host, Dean Akers, bringing you top CEOs and entrepreneurs every week that share their journeys. This week, we have Chase Stockton, who is the CEO of CEO of Panther International, a software-based company here in the Tampa Bay area that has a, literally a, a big footprint in the U.S. now, right, Chase? That's correct. Yeah, we, uh, we're we in 22 states. So tell me about the evolution of this business and because when we in the last segment we were talking about how you kind of started as a getting out of D.C. guy. Yeah. Coming down here, and this is how entrepreneurship starts a lot of times. It's a it's a vision, isn't it? Yeah. But it's moving from something a lot of times, too, isn't it? Well, I think that part of it was, you know, that now that's kind of ancient history in it. So, like I like I said, somewhere around, around year 8 to 10, there was, there was this kind of transition, if you will, that it, it, you can't keep – if you're successful, you can't keep a business small. Right. Um, and that was my original intent was just to, you know, sort of keep it small. Um, to avoid some of the the big headaches, the big business headaches, the this and that, um, sort of that government feel. 
Um, but you can't stop it. Um, if you're any good, you can't stop it. So we just sort of shifted gears completely and went with it. And, and that's really what, what began this big footprint, if you will. So we, you know, went from one state here that we were dealing with the Florida DOT now, 22 states. Um, we move grant management, um, for those clients and, um, you know, it's a, it's a whole different game because you have equity battles, you have cash flow battles, you have um, hiring and firing. We talk about hiring and, and you know, per, the personnel is probably the biggest thing. Treat your employees right. Um, I don't remember if it was Chris or you or somebody had said, you know, it's about the people, stupid. Oh, yeah. Um, totally. It, and that's really what it is. Um, we have, other than the tech skills that we do require, um, you know, a lot of our other positions, we've gone to hire great people. Um, the rest is trainable. Yeah, we so. were. I was talking to a gentleman coming over here earlier, and we were talking about how important having your your people are your biggest asset, and it really is, and developing them. And they don't leave for a nickel an hour or a dollar no. or an extra ten grand when they're happy. Right. They really don't. So, tell us about this journey with uh, with uh, Panther International. What exactly? are you accomplishing and you know what niche are you filling and helping in in that world of aviation yeah so it's it's actually gone well beyond aviation to uh all the modes transit uh seaports and and rail um pretty much so i'll just give you the the 30 second elevator pitch is that um, the state and the feds give money to these agencies they own the bridges and highways so they just issue contracts if they're going to fix something but um, for example, um, you know, the airport out here, if they want to help the airport do something, that's a separate um, authority. So they give them a grant. We are the process that they manage those grants. And that happens across the country. So um, it's from the state to these agencies. And whether it's um, converting buses for Heartline to natural gas or a route, they're going to subsidize a route. Or if it's rail, they want to do you know, a, a new railroad bridge over a culvert, whatever it may be. Um, that's the, the service that we provide. And, you know, for me, it's extremely rewarding in any of these 22 states to see a bus running because, you know, I'd love to have a sticker on that bus that says Panther International because in, in many cases they get their money or they're subsidized or they were converted to natural gas or whatever it may be because of what we've done. But, but what – so do you put the two parties together or – So we are the back office, if you will. So just a quick walk through through the system. If uh, Heartline wants to convert 15 buses to natural gas, they're going to buy the buses. They're going to convert them um, or they're going to buy them natural. They actually would log into a system that works for DOT. It is DOT. It branded for DOT. Um, they make the request. It gets, you know, through the process, the approval. It actually goes into the state budget. It comes back out of the state budget. It's approved. All those legal documents, that paperwork and everything that they do are tracked. Um, and then as they go out and buy the bus, they submit their reimbursement request through that system. So it's. How did you dream that up? Oh, uh, very carefully. Follow the money. Always follow the money. Um, That's the tip of the day. <laughs> follow, <laughs> Always the money. follow the money. Um, so, you know, for example, at the airport, all those projects that are going on, you see it right, yeah. here, right here at the airport. Um, you know, most of those, a lot of those um, have multiple funding sources, but the federal is, is part of it. The state is part of it and, and local bonds. Um, nowadays, there's also a passenger facility charge, that head tax. But putting those together... Um, the airport will go in and say, hey, we'd really like $5 million in federal. We'd really like, you know, two point five in state. We'll do the rest with bonds or in, and local. And they submit that. And if it gets approved at both the state and the federal level, then that's the management process. So then do you manage actually the money? or does So it- we manage the process. The invoices are submitted, the, the approvals, the legal documents, and all of that. The money's nowadays, the money's just electronically yeah, yeah, transferred. Nobody. So, But the, the, re, the, the requests are. Um, we're really, I, you know, I like to think of it, we're the canary in the coal mine. Um, when you see pro- projects in there, because the state maintains a, a 20-year work program, so they kind of have an idea where they're going to go for the next 20 years. We can kind of see peaks and valleys ahead of time um, for transportation. Obviously, right now, the, the Tampa Bay metro area, booming. 
um, in everything that we do. The airport's under construction. The um, you know freeways are all under, which leads to other stuff and and all of that. So. So, so Panther International is obviously doing well, and you've been doing that for a long time. You've been doing a lot of give back. I know you're involved with the military. Uh, you're, uh, I remember when you did the McDill Air Fest. I, <laughs> Chase is your best friend, by the way, listeners, when he's doing the McDill Air Fest. Because, you, you know, you, I'll just say he's your best friend when he's doing McDill Air Fest. Yeah. So tell me how all that, how you got into all this stuff, and you've really been on a give back campaign, haven't you? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, certainly for the, for the military base. So I, it was quite a while back. It was probably close to 10 years now. But, you know, we were talking about jobs, jobs, jobs. And I, you know, as a, a, I was dealing with um, the, the EDC and some of those, we were doing workforce and all of that. I realized that, you know, McDill is one of our largest employers in the area. And if you lost it, um, that would be a major loss of, of, of jobs, jobs, jobs. And so I realized I knew nothing about the base. And so I set about to learn about the base. And so I, you know, spent all the, I went to every meeting I could go to. I tried to learn, you know, kind of what it was and who was there and everything else. And um, uh, air, uh, air shows had been canceled because of sequestration. Anyway, at one of those meetings, you know, I kept sticking my head in, I guess. And at some point, the base commander said, hey, we think that we can get an air show, but we're going to need help from the community. Would you do that? And, you know, I guess I'd been to too many meetings because I said, OK, <laughs> and uh, that was the start of it. Um, but it was really a quest for, you know, understanding of jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, and, and people don't understand the impact, especially in the Tampa Bay area, but in other communities, how much the military really impacts not only just in its day to day stuff, but the transitioning veterans. Yeah, very much so. And, and you know, in, in a lot of places, I'm going to pick on somebody, but, you know, Abilene, Texas, the base is the town. Right. Um, kind of like a, you know, a small college town. But in Tampa, it's actually really different because McDill just sits alongside so much of everything else that's going on. And so I think we kind of forget the impact that it has. But, you know, not just from an economic impact, but there's 14,000. You know, employees going back and forth um, through there. But on top of that, Tampa's a great place. So a lot of them retire out and want to stay. Um, and we need to do a better job as a community um, in finding out how to employ. So as we get close to the end of today's show, give me a couple points you'd want our entrepreneur uh, listeners out there to take away from, from Mr. Chase. Well, I think, you know, I, I, we've hammered on the first one is is, you know, a great idea can fail if you can't find a market for it Um, because you'll run out of cash flow. So keep your day job until you uh, find that first client. But once you find that first client, I think that's a big piece. Um, I think probably the the second one, without a doubt, and it's kind of a no-brainer, but we forget about it, and that's about it's about the people, stupid. Um, Treat your people well. um, Take care of them. Uh, Are there any tips that you do that you could say to yourself, wow, I know I do this and a lot of people don't? I you know I, I I don't know that I could pick out one thing because it's really a holistic thing because you know one thing whether it's you know economic or whether it's whatever it is it, it isn't going to make a difference it it really is a holistic thing and so everything that we do um, or try to do and and instill but I think uh, what's the book um, ideal team player I don't know right. if you've gone through ideal team player you know that hunger and the and the humility and everything the the smart. That's really your pe- that's that's what's what you're after. When you're looking for people, hire people. And you got to hire people for their their core the core who they are, who not they so are. much their their skills. Skills sets. can be taught. Well, Chase, I want to thank you for uh sharing with us today on the show and uh much success to you in the future. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I want to th- remind all our listeners that the uh, CEO Hour broadcast, if you want to share this with your friends, it'll be posted up generally three or four days after this on all the major podcast uh, networks. And then also the Sales and Leadership Ninja Show is every week. And that's that's just crazy rants from me for 8 to 13 minutes. And I've got tens of thousands of downloads all over the world. I mean, it's a hoot doing that and i get a lot of feedback from there and and if you want our ceo physical just reach out to help at adjunctco.com that's help at jack adjunctco.com and we'll look forward to seeing you next week have a great week
Thanks for listening to this CEO Hour with Dean Akers, helping businesses and CEOs succeed in today's marketplace. Receive a free CEO physical when you connect with Dean at deanacres.com. That's deanacres.com. And join us again next week for the CEO Hour with Dean Akers.